Well, hello and welcome back, all you people eager to hear about bass. But first, let me uh, show, just to point out a few places on the website that you might be interested in going to. Uh, the videos that we're making right now are going to be posted here. Uh, sorry, here. Short courses, along with everything else that's on this page. You know, you have from uh, introductory to advanced factor analysis, structural equation modeling with continuous outcomes, and then with categorical and other strange outcomes, and then uh, into introductory intermediate growth modeling, advanced growth modeling, categorical latent variable modeling that is latent class, latent transition analysis modeling, and then in the longitudinal area, latent transition analysis modeling, and growth mixture modeling, and then multi-level modeling, cross-sectional data, multi-level modeling of longitudinal data, and two topic nine Bayesian analysis. Like I said, that, this is the latest version for that. And all the version seven workshops in 2012 three parts to it, has a lot of information there that's probably not fully utilized. Lots of uh, analysis possibilities that are not totally fully uh, put to use. So at the bottom of this list, we'll probably have these videos. So that's one thing. Um, another thing is in the uh, left column here under special M plus topics. Uh, what we talked about yesterday was mediation analysis. So there you have a lot of these things that we talked about, particularly counterfactual stuff here. And um, you also have the new entry, the new special topic, time series analysis, or DSEM, where you have uh, background papers. Like I emailed to some of you about this, but I don't think the email reached all of you. So you have uh, the paper that uh, Ellen was uh, borrowing from was her paper for uh, MBR, an application paper, which is really a useful start to understand these things. And then the technical paper up here by uh, where Tiamir took the lead, which uh, he, we haven't, he hasn't uh, submitted it yet because we're going to uh, modify it or extend it a little bit. So anyway, that's... Um, the M plus website, and um, by, oh, by the way, feel free to, uh, as I'm going to say later on, feel free to uh, submit papers to us, fitting in somewhere here, perhaps in the DSM application area. I'll read it and see uh, if it should be posted. <laughs> Is that diplomatic enough? Yeah. All right, enough of that website. Let's get back to, uh, there, our story. And our story is in your handout below, um, underneath what Ellen talked about. So it's at the bottom of that handout. So you should see that, this page there. And I'm really glad that the, so many people came to this workshop, or these workshops, rather. Uh, particularly this one, I guess, <clears throat> but also the one yesterday, but particularly this one, <clears throat> because it's such a fast developing area. And as we uh, try to dig into it and make algorithms available in M+, we realized that is, there are so many research topics here that we need your help with exploring, both for papers and for dissertations, both for substantive applications and for methods investigations. So lots of work that uh, we would love you to help us with. Um, I find it particularly interesting <clears throat> because I have no background, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, time series analysis. No training in that at all. I'm just trying to learn from my colleagues here, uh, Ellen Hamacher and Tiumar Asparojo, who are the experts. So this afternoon, when I'm going to talk about this, I'm going to do it uh, coming in at it, the topic from a totally different angle, 
from the angle of what we knew in the past uh, from M plus courses, for instance. And uh, if you ask me even a remotely difficult question, I'm going to hand it over to Ellen and Tima right away. And it's true, I don't know enough about the area, but I'm, I'm happily exploring it and, and trying to figure out more and more things. Ellen gave the substantive background and started talking about M plus modeling, going quite far into the M plus DSM modeling. I'm going to back up a little bit and uh, look at some of the uh, basic issues. The uh, occasion for this workshop is that M plus version 8 came out April, April 20th. I know it well. It was a hectic day. So what was introduced then is time series analysis. You know, uh, that term is usually re uh, reserved for n equals 1 studies, one unit uh, varying across time. Smog in LA used to be the common topic. And you know, BMDP T1 and T2, did anybody use those 50, 20 years ago? Yeah, right. They, uh, they were um, pioneers, but boy, was that hard to use. Linda Mutien was working there as a um, customer support person, and it crashed all the time. <clears throat> now it works very smoothly in M+, but we are going to take more of an interest in the two-level analysis, that is n greater than 1. And we're going to take, take a look at the, all these very various random effects, that is, coefficient, parameters that vary across individuals, that Ellen started talking about. And the reason there are so many of them, so many more than in typical multi-level modeling, is that subject is on level two. And anything that varies across subject has large variances. So we're going to have many more random effects, many more random slopes in particular, than we have in regular uh, cross-sectional two-level analysis. And the interesting thing is that uh, TMR also managed to go into the cross-classified area which is a generalization of the two-level case where random effects vary not only across subjects but also across time. And that's really exciting. I'm going to give you some examples of that, particularly uh, after the afternoon break. So try to hang in there to the end of today. So putting all of these techniques together and adding the general uh, parameterization of structural equation modeling on top of that, we reach something that we call decent dynamic structural equation modeling. Very general Lake variable modeling. So general that you really can only do it through Bayesian estimation. ML can be used for some special cases, but not the general cases that we're interested in. Statistical background that you can read about is this one that I pointed to before. It sits on our website there in the left margin. And I should tell you that tomorrow morning, you're really going to get the statistical background, the heavy duty tech stuff for the methods oriented people in the group. TMR is going to talk for two blocks, the morning and the early morning and the late morning. And uh, if you want to follow that, you better take a look at this paper uh, tonight, not light night reading. <laughs> Should put you to sleep right away. Uh, after the, the coffee break, TMR will become a little bit, little bit more applied, you know, applied in the TMR sense. But he's actually going to demonstrate the program, doing a little plot demonstrations uh, for you. So uh, it's going to be fun. We all, there is actually another paper here, uh, the, the uh, mixture version of all of this. And the paper is out, even though the program is not out. <laughs> Some bits and pieces of, of it uh, exist in TMR's laptop, you know, the one that you can look at for a fee. <laughs> and, but, uh, and whereas this exists in M plus version 8.0, but the paper has not been published. So a little bit upside down world here. The user's guide, as you saw uh, as you entered, it has now gotten quite thick, adding n equals 1 examples uh, in chapter 6 in the growth and survival chapter, and n greater than 1 examples in chapter 9, the multi-level chapter, with many parts to ex each example, basic and advanced versions of the setups. There's quite a lot of new stuff there. <clears throat> and also the web page has been added for our website. Uh, the special web page for, for this topic. So, let's see. I'm going to use Ellen's style of outline here again, which works pretty well. So what we're going to do um, now is take the step back and try to figure out 
what's in this black box of Bayesian analysis because, you know, sure, you can say estimator equals base, but wouldn't it be fun to know a little bit more about what's happening and be able to use it in more smart ways? So I'm going to talk about that and talk about an introduction to longitudinal analysis and n equals 1 time series analysis. And right about here is where we're going to have the break. I'm probably going to get into two level a little bit. But the goodies, I'm going to say, the really exciting things I'm going to save for after the coffee break. So this is uh, an extended version of what I said yesterday in the mediation uh, workshop. But I'll pretend that you never heard this before. Good story is worth telling twice, at least twice. OK, so you, we have a new estimator here. Instead of the standard estimator that we are used to, like ML, we're going to go to base. And we're going to talk about the advantages of base over ML. We're going to talk about an example, discuss what we mean by convergence. We're going to show various kinds of new plots, and talk about how long this takes in M plus, and give you some suggested readings. <clears throat> here you have it. Uh, the six points that I can think of as reasons for why you would be interested in base over ML. ML is uh, an example of so-called frequentist analysis, which is often uh, a uh, polar opposite of what Bayesian analysis is about, at least according to those who fought, fight for both sides. I would argue that base can be used to learn much more about parameter estimates, first of all. In ML, you usually strive for getting a good parameter estimate, one parameter estimate, and a standard error for that. Sometimes you want more than that, but that's, stand that's a standard approach. In uh, base, you get the whole distribution of the parameter estimate, whole distribution. Not only the mean and the variance or standard deviation or standard error, but the whole distribution so that you can create percentiles low and high to get confidence interval around the estimate. You can do something similar to that with ML by using bootstrapping, but of course that's an additional step in maximum likelihood, which sometimes can be a very time-consuming time -consuming step. Another advantage is that we don't need the large sample theory that ML builds on. You know, we have the estimate which, in large samples at least, has an approximately normal distribution for which uh, confidence intervals that are equal to the parameter estimate plus minus 1.96 times the standard error, that symmetric interval would be relevant because we, we believe that the parameter estimate has this approximate normal distribution, which is a symmetric distribution. You don't need that. You don't need that uh, large sample theory because Bayes makes no assumption that the parameter estimate distribution is normal. And in fact, it can often be quite non-normal. As we know from yesterday, the indirect effects, for instance, can be very non-normal, skewed in, in various directions. Particularly, uh, I would say, when the outcome is not continuous, when y is a binary or count. Small sample performance can be better with Bayes, at least if you use what's called a uh, weekly informative priors, and like I said yesterday, uh, I played around with that in 2010 in a working paper that sits on the website under papers, comma, Bayesian analysis, at the very bottom of that. Uh, particularly for uh, two-level data where you have a small number of two, level two units, small number of clusters, maybe even go as low as 10, you can perhaps do better with base over ML. And then this important point that analysis are in some cases much less demanding computationally. For instance, when uh, maximum likelihood uh, requires numerical integration, which is, as an example, happening when you do item response theory. You have a continuous latent variable, the tr trait, as it's called. And you have, say, binary right-wrong answers as factor indicators or trait indicators. That combination of continuous latent categorical observed uh, gives rise to the need for integrating over the factor so that you, own, so that you describe the, the marginal distribution for the observed items. That numerical integration gets very heavy if you have many factors, perhaps already with four factors or five factors, although you can get up to higher number of factors like 
seven, eight perhaps, but uh, the computing time goes up very quickly and the precision with the, of the estimates and the log likelihood goes down very quickly. Base has no such problems. And that's why we can work with so many uh, complex models. Uh, base has no, is not inhibited at all by the number of dimensions, or very little. And in fact, maximum likelihood, point number five, becomes impossible in many cases. And base can then be looked at as a computing algorithm that would give essentially the same results as maximum likelihood if maximum likelihood was compute, computationally feasible. So in large samples, and we base using non-informative priors, we're going to say what that is shortly, you would get, al get almost the same result with base as you would have with ML if you've been able to compute it. Which means that new types of models can be analyzed with base, which were impossible for ML. And DSEM, the topic of today and tomorrow, is, is a very good example. There are many other good examples, but that's a good example. Some DSEM models, uh, particularly those without random effects, can be done by ML, but not the uh, general ones that we're going to look at today. So, there you have it. Are you motivated? Okay. So why are the Bayesian computations possible when ML computations are not? Just to understand that a little bit deeper, ML works with a joint distribution of all variables to find parameter values that give the log likelihood maximum. So joint distribution of all variables, say all of those binary factor indicators that I just mentioned. Bayes doesn't need to consider that. It considers a series of conditional distributions it's not conditional distributions for the variables, but conditional distributions for the unknowns. That is, for the parameters, for instance. A series of conditional distributions, breaking it down in a series of conditional distributions, is computationally much easier to deal with than uh, the ML description of the joint distribution of all variables. The joint distribution can be difficult. Conditional distribution can be easier. That's the main reason. What are we talking about when we talk about priors? Let's take a moment to just be sure about that. And first note that the default of M plus is non-informative priors. But let me first tell you what informative priors are. So on the x-axis here, we, have, we consider one parameter, and we want to find the best estimate of that parameter. We want to find a point on this x-axis that we can call the, the parameter estimate value. And if you use maximum likelihood, uh, the likelihood ha it has a peak somewhere, hopefully, very well defined. That is the point on the x-axis where the first order derivative is zero, the, where it's flat here. The second order derivative has to be of the certain kind, so it's not a minimum, instead of an optimum. That's a nice case. So the ML estimate would be here. So if you, if you don't mind, you should scribble here. This could be uh, theta hat or whatever you want to call the parameter, but hat it should be, that is, the M, and then subscript ML, ML estimate of the parameter. Now what Bayesians do, as opposed to frequentists like maximum likelihood analysts, well let me back up, maximum likelihood people, frequentists consider parameters as something fixed. It's a fixed unknown quantity. Bayesians consider parameters as distributions as random variables that have a prior distribution uh, where the most likely value here is here at the top, at the peak of the prior, uh, but uh, based on previous analysis and, and substantive uh, theories, but mostly, I hope, previous analyses from real data, you have a fairly good notion about approximately what the uh, estimate might be what the parameter value might be. So the peak is here, but you're not saying that you know exactly that it's here, but you put a little bit of a variance around it. The smaller the variance, the stronger your belief, the prior information that you have. The larger the variance, the less you, you uh, uh, believe that you know where, it would, where the estimate would land. So what Bayes does is to weigh together the likelihood from maximum likelihood with the prior 
to get a posterior. And that's obtained by the so-called Bayes theorem, a very simple theorem for going backwards. That's how I, my short-term description of it. It's in the, the book, uh, our new regression and mediation book, if you want to read about Bayes. Now, you may not like to use prior information, even if it's solidly based on previous studies. You want to start from scratch. Well, in that case, you should use non-informative priors, the default of M+, which means that the prior has a very large variance and almost doesn't change the information contained from the data in the likelihood, so that the posterior and the likelihood have their peaks at approximately the same parameter value. That's what M plus does by default. Non-informative prior, even though it's not informative, the computing algorithm is totally different than the maximum likelihood computing algorithm. And you get these speed advantages that I mentioned. So we have non-informative priors, also called diffuse priors. They have very large variance. It's huge in M plus. I forget what it is, but very large. Uh, reflecting uncertainty, large uncertainty in parameter value. And we have informative priors at the bottom here, reflecting prior beliefs in likely parameter values, which may come from substantive theory combined with previous studies of similar populations. Think meta analysis, where you do a repeated set of uh, uh, interventions, for instance, in the same population, and you look at the intervention effect, and you have a pretty good notion about how big it's going to be, but it varies a little bit. So you have a prior with its variance. Weakly informative priors are also used in M plus actually for uh, thresholds in categorical variable outcomes because thresholds sometimes need a little uh, extra assistance so that the uh, iterations moving towards convergence don't veer off into some strange areas. Actually that's very similar to maximum likelihood especially for instance in um, I IRT with a 3PL model the three parameter logistic model with guessing parameter the guessing parameter is one of those parameters that need assistance in its estimation. They have a little penalty function in maximum likelihood in most IRT programs to guide the convergence to the right parameter estimate. This works very much the same in the base. But we use that very sparingly, although it's a great idea for some, some uh, applications. Uh, saying that we don't want parameter estimates to go off into an impossible area, a totally ridiculous area. Andrew Gelman has written about that uh, very much. Actually, he had a big article in uh, JRSS, Journal of Royal Statistical Society. He, the paper was read in London and had lots of comments. Uh, it just came out in uh, JRSS A or B. It's a nice discussion about using weekly informative priors. Now, the real advantage of base that you should not be afraid of using someday when you're ready for it, but not first, is using informative priors. Frequencies don't like that. They think then base becomes subjective instead of objective, not only using the data objectively, but using uh, prior information or beliefs. But I would argue that frequencies already do use informative priors in many cases, although in unrealistic ways. A pertinent example for us is CFA, confirmatory factor analysis, where we specify a lot of fixed zero loadings. And we say that's based on theory, but the theory cannot be so strong as to say that it's exactly zero. Instead, you can imagine a prior which has mean zero and perhaps a very small variance around it, but still a little bit of wiggle room so that uh, the theory is better match, I mean the uh, analysis better matches the theory. Theory is not that precise. So you can do this uh, informative priors in uh, confirmatory factor analysis in uh, M plus since version 6 actually. And uh, that's what we call BSEM, a special Bayesian approach to SEM, which was published uh, in um, 2012 I think in Psychological Methods. So it's on our website. The, uh, the advantage of posterior distributions with uh, informative priors is that the credibility interval is, uh, that is the Bayesian confidence interval is shorter. You have more precise statements. Let's take an example, just as to uh, get you into this um, analysis. 
So you have, uh, in this case, a bivariate situation. You have two variable mathematics scores in grade 7 and grade 10. And for some people, you have missing data in uh, grade 10. Perhaps they dropped out of high school and weren't there or some other reason. Say that we assume uh, bivariate normality for these two variables. Then uh, and Bayesian analysis considers three sets of unknowns. The two means, the two variances, and the covariance, where those two first bullets uh, describe the five parameters of the bivariate normal. But we are going to break them up into the means and the variance covariance. But third, the third set are the missing values on math 10 for the N2 people. So the missing values become unknowns in base. They become parameters. You know, parameters are unknown things, but missing data uh, pieces are unknown as well. So in your estimation, for the same price, you get estimates, you get the imputed values, so to speak. So the way this um, uh, estimation goes is to use so-called Markov chain Monte Carlo techniques uh, which there are many different variations, Gibbs sampling, and Metropolis Hastings, and many others are examples. Here's how it, it's done in M+. You start with drawing values for the two means. So first you try to figure out what the two means should be. Then given the two means, you draw values for the n two missing values on math 10. And then given the, means, given the means and the missing values, you draw values for the two variance covariance parameters. So three steps that you keep iterating. But first of all, what do I mean by draw? In ML you don't draw anything. You move forward by looking for when the first order derivative gets to zero. And it just moves smoothly towards that. But in this case, the computations are based on random draws. So say that you have a, a random number generated that generates normal numbers, you take a random value. Often they're close to zero, but many are far off. That's what you do. You keep drawing very often in the MCMC, the normal distribution that you draw from. So you just draw a random value to get the two means. Conditional, it's conditional distribution on the means, conditional on the other unknowns. And once you have those, you can draw values for the missing values. And once you have those, you can draw values for the variance covariance parameters. And then you go back to step one, and step two, and step three, and magically this converges, according to smart statisticians. And we keep doing this 100 times before we report the first iteration in the M plus tech eight output, technical eight output. So it's random draws, and here's what it looks like when you draw. It's described in a trace plot. So on the x-axis, we have the iterations. Uh, which eventually over there on the right somewhere converge. And I'm going to tell you what I mean by converge. On the y-axis we have one parameter, the mean for math 10 that we're trying to estimate. So this is for one parameter. So we start at, say, a list-wise estimate of the mean, 63.7. And then we take a random draw from the distribution, the, the, this distribution conditional on other unknown things. And it goes up a little bit. And then the next iteration it goes down and down, down, and then up, down, up, down. And you see that it starts to uh, come towards sort of a uh, stable level here. But you have jumps up and down. What this eventually leads to is not a parameter estimate, not only a parameter estimate. It leads to a whole distribution for this parameter estimate. And how should you view the distribution? Well, you should really tilt your head to the left like this and then see that if you imagine a distribution here, most values are in the middle, many are out in the tails. Can't you imagine a normal distribution there? Well, if you can't, we have a movie for you. <laughs> we look at this posterior distribution and here's what it looks like. I mean, rather the trace plot. And here are the parameter values, and we turn our head, and this is what it looks like the other way, tilting to the left. And those points rumble down into a distribution 
and we have now formed the posterior distribution of the parameter estimate and we take that to be the estimate, the peak or the median or the mean and we get the percentiles out of that posterior distribution so the 95% credibility interval lies between here that's it that's how it should be viewed so this becomes a distribution if we go far enough we throw away uh, an initial period of draws which are too far away from being stabilized around this mean uh, they are called the burn-in phase and that's actually the first half of the distribution of the number of iterations and we're going to work with two process two chains two different uh, processes like this going forward in parallel computed on different processors so it goes very quickly and we take the last we throw away the first half for both of them that means together they give the total number that you specified when you asked for the number of iterations so what you end up with then after 10 iterations this is something that doesn't look like much, much but after 100 iterations you start discerning a normal distribution after 500 it's getting even better and 10,000 a very nicely smooth normal distribution for the mean and they're missing data and the estimate then just like ML that we talked about for missing data yesterday in the bivariate case draws on all available data it's a full information estimator and it's uh, unbiased, unbiased and correct uh, under MAR missing at random that is missing that's that it's predicted by variables that are observed that have no missing namely the math 7 score and here's what it looks like Bayesian posterior distribution this is for the parameter estimate in this case it's actually the indirect effect of something in a mediation model so you get the uh, mean the mo well, the mean the median and the mode and you can choose which one you like best it usually doesn't make a difference some simulations say that the mean is better than the median and plus default is median and you get the confidence bands here too uh, the percentiles 2.5 percentile 97.5 and we have a non-symmetric interval uh, that distance here is shorter than the distance up there which it should be because of the skewedness there and the point is that you would get almost exactly the same information if you did ML plus bootstrapping this is the bootstrap parameter estimate distribution so very often you're not going to find any difference between ML and, and um, base but in some cases ML can't be used Convergence, uh, here's how you look at that. You look at the trace plot, in this case, using the default of two iterations going forward in parallel from different starting points. Uh, one is red and one is blue. Here's the cutoff where we throw away this, these draws, these iterations. Draw and iteration means the same thing. That's the burn-in period. And we use only these draws, these parameter value points, to form that posterior distribution by tilting our head to the left so to judge convergence there is a whole set of possibilities and those who have used a base for many years using say the bugs program from Britain you're familiar with the CODA program by Nikki Best and others CODA one criterion uh, but there are many others is the potential scale reduction criterion which uh, is a PSR that's printed in technical 8 and M plus such that uh, values close to one indicates convergence to a distribution that you can trust and that means that the between chain variation is small relative to the within chain variation you have within chain variation of course because that's supposed to describe the, the full parameter distribution but you don't want the between chain variation to be uh, large relative to the within chain variation then you haven't gone to convergence yet one big warning here uh, convergence needs to be using PSR needs to be uh, taken uh, very seriously uh, it could run into a problem called premature stoppage so you have the PSR value on the y-axis and you want to come down to the value 1 that line x-axis is the uh, number the iterations MC MC Marco chain Monte Carlo iterations it can this PSR value can go down to one for several iterations 
but then bounce up again until it stabilizes like that. So you want to make sure that if you have convergence, you may want to go a little further in the iterations so that you see uh, values close to 1 for a longer time. It should be 1.0 something typically. 1.0, not 1.1. 1 .1. So that's something you should look out for. And where you look is you ask for tech 8 all the time in base. It's very useful. That's why I recommended that to, to Ellen. So you, you have the iteration number here. It's numbered by the hundreds, like I mentioned. You have the PSR value here. And you get the parameter with the highest PSR here. So you see here, it starts already at very close to 1. But then eventually, it goes up to 1.8, 1.2. And certainly, it has not converged here. So you should continue until it stabilizes to have a lot of values uh, in the 1.0 something range, a whole bunch of them. And you can see uh, from, from the Tech 8 uh, how long you have to go. In this case, perhaps you have to go to 5,000 iterations. And you see here the time that's needed for each iteration. So you can gauge from that um, in conjunction with how PSR behaves, you can judge how long the run is going to take. And some of them are going to take quite a long time. You need to look at um, trace plots uh, that show um, the, the iterations over time. This is a good one. It's uh, a, a uh, level picture. It doesn't have an upwards or downwards trend. And you have nice zigzagging caterpillar behavior here. This is a bad plot. Uh, even after uh, uh, throwing away these initial uh, iterations, you have a progression that goes up and down, perhaps indicating two different solutions, and certainly not stabilizing. Likewise, uh, you, uh, you want to have a distribution of parameter estimate values where the draws are largely independent, so you can estimate the variance correctly, like independence in the random sampling. And therefore, autocorrelation, that is correlation between values at different distance from each other in the iterations, the distance marked by this lag here goes from 1 to 30. Those correlations should be very close to 0. It should not look like this, where the correlation is close to 1, even up to 30. That means that the parameter is very tough to estimate. The mixing is poor. Mixing meaning that uh, not only do we have correlated observations, but probably uh, we don't visit all parts of the parameter space properly. You know, you want to describe the parameter distribution very well. All right. That's the main guts of it. Speed of base and M plus, uh, pretty good. Here's a paper that uh, compared uh, ML with base for moderated mediation, a topic relevant to yesterday. And they used bugs. And M plus was 15 times faster. And the reason is that M plus uses Fortran. M plus uses parallel computing. So each of those two chains are computed separately. And this bullet is due to a TMR tailor making every application, possible application area of M plus. He tailor makes how the algorithm, Bayesian algorithm, is written. It can be done in so many different ways, some very inefficient ways, and some very efficient ways. Largest updating blocks means uh, that you work with, if, if unknowns like parameters and missing data are highly correlated, you want to put them in the same block, but you want to have uncorrelatedness between blocks. Tiermer is going to talk about that uh, tomorrow morning. Now, I would also argue that M plus base is considerably easier to use uh, than other base programs, but you may have a different taste. I uh, played around with bugs in the, in the early 90s, and um, it's quite, I found it quite technically oriented, statistically oriented towards the statistical PhD person rather than, uh, say, a uh, psychologist who want to use advanced methodology and uh, get some uh, answers to their substantive questions. Nevertheless, even though M plus base is faster than other base programs, it's going to take a lot longer doing DSEM modeling than the uh, computing times that you're used to. 
So the talk that I'm going to give now on the applications of this, I'm going to use a data set with uh, 230 people and about 150 time points. I do an n equals 1 analysis as a starting point. One person takes zero seconds. So that's nice. <laughs> and, but then I do a two-level analysis and we immediately jump up to three, almost four minutes. And a cross-classified analysis trying to find a trend, which I'm going to show is quite exciting how you can find a trend by cross-classified analysis, takes a little bit over one minute. If you put the trend into the two-level setting, it takes 442 instead of 354. If you could do a cross-classified trend analysis, it takes 34 minutes. Cross-classified factor analysis of ordinal indicators, in this case negative affect that we talked about this morning, almost an hour. If they're dichotomous or dichotomized, it's a little faster. If the indicators are continuous, it's even faster, faster relative to the ordinal case. And this is the PC that I had in five years ago. Uh, the most important thing is that um, I, have, I had 3.4 gigahertz on the, uh, for the processor. <laughs> and now I just got a new computer that I haven't done, had time to unpack because of this workshop. Uh, which is going to cut off 33% of the time. It has uh, 4.3 gigahertz. And, but then you can also overclock it, which is the term for, you know, souping it up a little bit. <laughs> and then uh, instead of dropping down by 33%, Morton tells me it's going to drop down to about 40% time saving. So that's pretty good. So uh, that's uh, 4.3 gigahertz and overclocked is 4.8 gigahertz. So that's the mo most important, for base, that's the most, the gigahertz for the CPU is the most important factor. Yes, you should have more than one processor. I uh, got eight processors then, I think I have eight processors now too. Having many more processors than two is more important for mixture modeling where you do a lot of random starts searching around. But it's less important in this context. All right, if you want to read more about BASE, and are, if you're statistically oriented, you should read this book. I recommend that. There are many others, of course. A more applied one is the Lynch book. We have lots of BASE technical reports on the M M Plus website, under papers, BASE analysis, which documents very carefully everything we do. And that was written for uh, uh, version six, so it goes back to 2010, I think. Uh, and that's the paper that I mentioned where I played around with um, a weekly informative priors for two-level modeling. But if you really want to read about base in the M plus context, then you should read chapter nine of this book that we, uh, that's floating around here, uh, which is devoted to how M plus does base. All right, that was the first prelude. Uh, stepping back and looking into the black box of Bayesian analysis at least a little bit. Now, um, another general topic that I want to cover that has to do with uh, DSM for the case where you have trends. So not a flat development, but something that goes up over time or down over time. I, I found it useful to start with uh, what we know about that kind of analysis from the past. Uh, for instance, when we talked about growth modeling here in the past in M+. So I'm going to get into an introduction to longitudinal analysis because that, I think that will help us to hang our newfound knowledge onto things that we really know very well and just remind ourselves about some basic concepts because it can get very confusing later down the line in the, uh, later after the coffee in the afternoon. And then I'm going to get into the guts of the analysis. Okay, so here we go. Prelude number two, methods for longitudinal data. We're going to distinguish between non-intensive longitudinal data, that is the growth modeling uh, type of data that we're used to, uh, you want to have perhaps three or four time points, sometimes you have up to ten. But number of time points, T, is usually very small and N is very large. Large number of people. And examples of that is autoregressive cross-lag modeling, which uh, Ellen talked about in the uh, dynamic setting, and growth modeling. 
Intensive longitudinal data, T is much larger, 30 to 200 and very much higher than that in many cases, physiological measurements of which I know some of you have very interesting ones like very closely spaced uh, <coughs> glucose measurements for type 8 diabetes situations. Or as we will hear this af no, tomorrow afternoon, uh, household energy consumption measured very often. So we're going to have very large T, whereas N is going to be smallish relative to non-intensive longitudinal data. Uh, but we have seen studies where you have quite sizable samples as well. Often the number of time points is greater than N, and the modeling we shall see what you have already seen here through what Ellen, whoa, Ellen talked about. So one common method is the uh, autoregressive modeling that Ellen talked about, that is uh, Y2 is influenced by Y1, Y3 by Y2, this is a lag one autoregressive for one variable. And then the cross lag modeling for two variables, like smoking urge and negative affect. Does negative affect irritations uh, at time one influence smoking urge at time two, for instance? And is there a reverse relationship on top of the autoregressive relationships for the same variable. We're going to, uh, here are some references for that that are quite uh, new and interesting by somebody called Hamaker and others in the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psych and in Child Development. All of them use uh, M+, so you will feel familiar when you read those. But I'm going to focus on this instead. The growth modeling uh, is what moves us closer to the trend modeling that we're going to do in the DSEM framework. So we start with looking at the data, and as often, it's most important uh, as a statistician, I think, to start with the data for the individual. And that is, look at uh, each individual separately. Here we have time on the x-axis. In this case, it's actually grades, but we have, don't have to worry about that. And you have outcome uh, y on the y-axis. And you have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 subjects, 10 individuals. And you see their development over time. They start at a little bit different uh, levels already at the first time point. You have variation here. And you have variation in how quickly they grow. This person doesn't grow at all. This person <laughs> grows uh, nicely and linearly. These, these people grow very quickly. So you have variation uh, in the uh, starting point, initial value, and in the uh, growth rate over time. In fact, you could actually estimate these curves, or estimate uh, a, a regression model here, y regressed on time. So this is the x value. You could do that for each person. You know, you have more data points, in this case five, than say the two or three in linear regression. Perhaps you could even do quadratic regression. So for each individual, you could fit a curve over time. Why do I keep emphasizing that? Well, I want to remind you that time is really a within-person value var variable, and growth, the development over time, is really a within-level process. In this case, we don't do it as between within. We do it, uh, show the picture here, in a wide format instead of the long format. So we have the wide format single-level approach as opposed to the long format two level approach that Ellen talked about and that we will shortly get to. So the variation in starting point is represented by a random effect, what we usually call a growth factor, the initial status factor, and the growth rate is S, the slope varying across time. Uh, the rate with which they uh, grow over time is, is, is uh, determined by the coefficients on these uh, paths. This looks like a confirmatory factor analysis model, and it is. Typically, you fix all of these parameters, all the loadings are fixed. But nevertheless, this model often uh, fits rather well. So you have variation across time here and variation across people here. And you can describe the variation. Uh, for instance, if this is math development, you could describe it by the family SES, which tends to increase the initial value and tends to increase the, uh, the slope over time. You can add time varying covariates like this as well, uh, something that varies across uh, the five time points in this case. 
So why is regular growth modeling not sufficient for intensive longitudinal data? And I, they helped me to think of two problems. And uh, it says correlation between time points is not fully explained by the growth factors. Let's go back here and take a look at that. If you look at slide 26, not only do these INS latent variables or random effects variables uh, vary across individuals, they also explain why the outcomes correlate across time. The so-called intra-class correlation. These variables correlate across time because they're influenced by the same variables. Okay, so we describe correlation between time points. And what we're saying now, two slides later, Correlation between time points is not fully explained by growth factors alone because with ILD, ILD data, we have very closely spaced measurements. So you need to add an autocorrelation on top of the correlation that the growth factors or random effects uh, explain. And the second problem is that the time series with ILD data are way too long for uh, using the regular uh, machinery for analysis that we use for growth modeling causing two slow comp computations. Now you can solve problem number one by adding to the correlation that is explained by INS, you add the correlations between the residual across time. So here I draw a little circle for the residual. It is a latent variable, but we don't pay much attention to it. So we give it a smaller circle than these. But you could do this autoregression. The residual at time 2 is uh, influenced by the residual at time 1 plus a residual on the residual. This is uh, doing it in a single level wide format. We have an example in the user's guide, example 6.17, that shows how to do this autoregression among the residuals. Uh, the approach gets a little cumbersome with large t though, so it's not really a total uh, uh, solution to problem 1. Problem one being the correlation between time points that we need to do well on. Uh, this is a, uh, an, a wide analysis, I want to repeat, and that means that Y has five columns in the data. Of course, solving number problem number two, we are familiar with how to do that. We switch from single level wide format to two level long format, and Y ends up as only one column in the data. So we don't have, when we have 100 time points, we don't have 100 columns, we have just one. And we regress Y on time, and this is a within level uh, regression. This is a two level analysis, you have within and between. You regress on time, which is the variable, and that regression have, has a random intercept and a random slope. The same INS that we talked about, those filled circles become open circles, namely continuous latent variables, on between that are then regressed on the between level variable W, the background of the family. So these, these uh, quantities vary across subjects and here we consider the variation across time, the dynamic part as Ellen talked about. This is shown how to do this uh, growth modeling in a two level uh, long format is sh shown in user's guide example 9.16. It looks like this, here's the model again. And here's the input, cluster equals subject. Within equals time, we agreed that time was within variable right. Between is uh, the family or the, the uh, subject's background. Two level random because we have S bar Y on time. So we, when we regress Y on time here, we have a random slope, which becomes a latent variable on between together with the intercept I, which is by default called the same as the variable in M plus, so it's called Y instead of I. Y is the same as I. And then you need to co correlate the residuals here. But, so that solves problem number two, but what happened to the autocorrelation? And we want to make it random too, which M plus is really good at doing now. Uh, the total solution is therefore that you do two level analysis, long format, with an autocorrelation that's added here. So yt is influenced by yt minus 1. We're going to talk about the alternative when the residual of I, yt is influenced by the residual for yt minus 1. But let's keep it simple like this for now. So we have the idea 
uh, of why regressed on time, given the INS growth factors, once again, on between. But we draw the model uh, for two adjacent time points. I chose t and t minus 1. Sometimes people add t plus 1 here, but I think this is sufficient. Showing that we have dot, dot, dot to the left, t minus 1, t minus 2, and dot, dot, dot to the right, t plus 1, etc. So this is my way of showing a, a two-level time series analysis. I'm going to elaborate on that a little bit later. So the, the issue that I mentioned of uh, auto regression being for the full variable or for the residual part of the variable uh, is something that Ellen has described very nicely in the social methods and research article for 2005, uh, describing these two approaches and how they relate to each other. I really recommend that for a good understanding. All right, we put ourselves in a good position now to uh, work with an example that we're going to work with for most of the rest of the day. It's a smoking cessation example, ecological momentary assessment style data collection. And we're going to do a whole series of analysis from n equals 1 to 2 level to cross-classified and trend analysis and time varying effect, TVEM modeling using cross-classified time series analysis. So where are we in the outline? You might be lost here at this point. Well, we are actually at bullet number 3 here. N equals 1 time series analysis. So um, here's the data description. It's a data that Saul Schiffman was very kind to provide to me. It comes, it's described in an article by Shioko in Prevention Science, uh, where she had another uh, TVEM type of approach to, uh, to this data set. Uh, like I said, uh, a moderate number of time points. Some would say it's high, I would say it's moderate perhaps. And they are randomly, m m randomly measured during the day. Say five times per day is what they aim, and there are random prompts across the day from a personal digital assistant. So not fixed time points, but random, which causes uh, time interval uh, issues. The outcome variable that we're going to focus on is smoking urge on an 11-point scale. And we're going to relate smoking urge to negative affects which is an average of 10 items having to do with being unhappy, irritable, miserable, tense, discontent, frustrated, angry, sad, which could uh, imagine have something to do with trying to, smoke, trying to quit smoking. And we're going to relate it to gender, age, and uh, an outcome variable, quitting or relapsing, successfully quitting smoking or relapsing. So we have um, two subjects that I picked out for n equals 1 analysis, just to illustrate what you can see in the data. And this is plots that come out of M+. Plus. Here's a, a subject who actually didn't quit, smoking urge on the y-axis and time uh, on the x-axis. Uh, you see that the smoking urge tends to go up over time. Uh, somebody who just can't get off the cigarettes. And the smoking level is pretty high and compared to the Subject number five, the vertical the horizontal line here is lower here than here. And the variation is pretty high as well. So the mean and the variance is actually higher than for subject five. The autocorrelation is fairly small for data that jumps up and down like that. So the autocorrelation is much smaller here than here. The autocorrelation here is higher, perhaps mostly because uh, we have a trend. Trend tends to uh, increase or inflate the autocorrelation. So uh, mean variance and autocorrelation vary across these two people. And we're actually going to see a fourth source, <coughs> source number four, for uh, parameters that vary across subjects. Here we have the uh, output from the M plus analysis. And the, we see here that urge is regressed on urge at the previous time point. That's uh, what Ellen described. But it's also re uh, regressed on negative affect. And we have an intercept, and we have residual variance. So you see, for instance, then, that the intercept, this is for subject 227, is higher than the intercept for subject 5. That's what we saw in the data. The residual variance is higher for subject 227 than it is for subject 5. The autocorrelation is lower for subject 227 than it is for subject 5. And the fourth component that's different is the regression coefficient on y, on x, so to speak, 
uh, is higher for and significant for subject two to seven, but negative and insignificant for subject five. So four things that vary. So this could be fun, you know, you can just scroll through the data and do these kinds of plots. Now, one issue that comes up is this T interval um, matter, because the time points are random. So two individuals, these two individuals don't, don't have the same distance between their different time points. And you want to take that into account because that affects the, if nothing else, the autocorrelation. So we want to create a new time variable and insert missing data records to align data with respect to time. They're misaligned, we want to align them. Uh, the need for alignment could be due to missed measurement occasions that are not assigned a missing value flag, or in this case, due to random measurement occasions. I'm going to show you an example of that. The creation of this new time variable uh, should really be built on both substantive and statistical considerations. Substantive uh, meaning what's a good time distance to consider what makes substantive change, uh, sense in terms of what a relevant development has had time, sufficient time to uh, occur. This is described in very technical terms here in the paper, and TMR is going to talk about this from a technical point of view tomorrow morning. But here is my um, take on approximately how it works. And this is for one subject now, a single subject. Observed time given in fractions of a day. Observed time being this column. It goes from early in the morning to uh, late at night. Fraction of, you know, uh, 24 hours. So we're going to work with an interval of 0 0.08, which is approximately two hours. Two divided by 24. You're going to divide by 24 quite a lot in the future, I promise you. 0 0.0833. The bin size, therefore, is 0 0.08. What is meant by bin? Well, here are the bins. The lowest bin is 0 0.28 to 0 0.36, because the difference is 0 0.08. And we chose that bin because the midpoint of that corresponds to the lowest observed time value. We give that time value the, time, the new time value, value 1. And that outcome is observed at that time. If the next uh, observed time, 39, fits into that bin. 51 fits in that. 59 fits in that, etc. But here, we have nobody who fits into that bin. You know, the bins are all the same. So we have nobody in that bin, so the new time value of 6 doesn't have an outcome that's observed, so we put in missing there instead. And then this value uh, falls into that bin, so that gets time value of 7, and we use the observed outcome for that. The next slot is missing, so the outcome is uh, recorded as missing. So 0 0.32 times 24 is 741 in the morning which is the midpoint of the first bin. So um, I think that's approximately right. I checked with our, one of our programmers, and, um, Thuy Nguyen, uh, who uh, agreed that that was what she understood that TMR asked her to do. <laughs> so if you do this now, uh, inserting these missing data records for subject five, the one who quit, and, and plot it, you see that there are holes here and there in the development. This layout, by the way, is designed by Ellen Hamaker. She can be very um, uh, good in suggesting. <laughs> for what, what, do you think I was going to say demanding? No. <laughs> now, so uh, you see the uh, holes here. But don't worry too much about choosing uh, the right way of inserting missing values. If you don't insert missing values for this subject, the urge on urge uh, lag 1 uh, is the estimate we saw on the previous slide here. And the original negative affect is this. If you do this t, t interval 0 0.08 binning and introducing missing data, then you get fairly similar results, significant at the same point. All right. How do you do uh, n equals 1 analysis in N plus? Well, it's very simple. Uh, Ellen described most of this. You have a, a lag for urge, lag one. And you can have higher lags. Uh, here's the T interval uh, option where you decide how 
precise or how wide the binning should be. This is what uh, Ellen referred to as the bin, and tomorrow morning, Tiomer is going to talk about this as a delta. delta. And the only thing new really here is that we use use observation to pick only subject 5. That gives you the n equals 1 analysis. That's the only thing that's different from n greater than 1 analysis, except that we don't ask for a, a two level, uh, type equals 2 level analysis. It's type equals single level analysis. But we do a regression of urge on urge, lag 1, and negative affect. So I guess the two things are different. Use observations, and it's not two level, it's single level. So we don't have to say type equals two level. It defaults to single level. We're doing really well here. We're sailing along. So now that n equals one time series analysis has told us that we have uh, four possible random effects, right? And we're going to utilize that uh, understanding in our analysis of all of the smoking data subjects and allow for parameter variation across the subjects using random effects. So random effects sort of sounds like a statistical term. Random sounds like haphazard. All we mean by that is that parameter values differ across individuals, across subjects. This is then doing the analysis that Ellen talked about uh, this morning. Two, she talked about two-level analysis the whole morning. So I'm going to start where she, uh, went, where she went, where she, what she was working with. I'm going to start that and then take it a little bit further uh, in terms of trends and cross-classified analysis. But first I want to do the two-level analysis. And you see then right away that my pictures are a little bit different than hers. This describes the model on the within level. Below here would be the model on the between level with all the uh, circles, the uh, continuous latent variables representing random effects. But I want to focus on the within level, the dynamic part. Like Ellen, I choose these filled black circles for the random effects. The random intercept sitting at that box. Uh, the random slope phi or phi. The random residual variance without headphones and the random slope for smoking urge on negative affect. I draw it for two time points. I draw it this way full well knowing that this is not exactly the model that's analyzed behind the scenes. That is, you have to know then that what's really done on the within level is to do this regression for the uh, within level latent variable centered component of the total variable. Uh, Ellen had a very nice way of representing that, where you did, did that decomposition into within and between latent variable parts from the observed. And then she showed the model for the within parts up here in terms of circles. That's one way of doing it more completely. And in the M plus user's guide, for example, 9.30, uh, I did yet another way. And actually, I think you saw, Ellen showed that one too. But when you get more and more uh, complicated models, I think uh, it, this simplistic ap approach uh, can be useful to describe it pictorially uh, in a simple way, even though you have to then take into account that it's not totally faithful to the modeling. So we have four random effects here, and uh, you can ask, what do we do with these guys? Well, you should think of them uh, in the first round you should think of them as x variables in regression. We never specify a model for the x variables. While well, you do maybe now when you've heard about bringing x's into handle missing data. But typically, the x variables in regression, they don't have parameters that get estimated in the regression analysis. You estimate alpha, beta, intercept, slope, and the residual variance. You get the variances, covariances, correlations among the x variables from sample statistics outside of the model. Same thing here. Uh, except when you have missing data on this, and we're going to see uh, results of that, then you may want to bring it into the model. If you bring it into the model, maybe you do want to have uh, auto, -regression, auto regression also for that uh, explanatory variable. And once you're into that thinking, why not? Why don't you think that negative affect at the previous time point influences the smoking urge at, at the next time point uh, with a 
for a, for a substantively meaningful time difference. It could be that when you were irritable here, it led you to smoke then. Or you can have this going down like that, I actually explore that smoking urge does not tend to influence negative affect, but negative affect tends to influence smoking urge. But of course you could have the, the full model like this. Uh, so there you have the uh, cross lag model that Ellen talked about in this smoking example context. I'm, I'm going to stick to this model. This is the model that I'm going to choose to specify the input for. And what do you have here? Just repeating what we learned this morning to emphasize it. You have your use variable list and you have to smoking urge, negative affect. I'm going to relate that to age and female. We like into regular two level analysis in M plus, we declare what the cluster a variable is, what the variable is that de uh, describes what cluster you're in, and that's going to be the variable subject, which sits up in the uh, uh, data set up here. Uh, between variables are female and age, between meaning variation across subject, and now we're going to declare negaf as a within variable. Uh, it, by that M plus mainly means we're not going to try to model variation across subjects in negative affect uh, separate from the within variation. In fact, this is going to be the whole observed variable that we're going to work with. And uh, if I just go forward to the next slide, we work with the whole variable here in the regression of urge on negative affect. Just like in regular multi-level modeling, if you do HLM, for instance, in Rodenbush and Bright style, when you have a random slope, it's for the whole observed variable. And however, random Rodin, Bush, and Breich also then in the random slope situation recommends uh, to do uh, cluster mean centering of, of that explanatory variable. And that's what we do here. Center by group mean the negative affect variable. So we get rid of, uh, we don't want to confound within and between matters here as Ellen so eloquently described. We have uh, lagged for both urge and negative affect because we have both those uh, arrows drawn. If we wanted to, we could also have the uh, cluster mean uh, ver version of the negative affect as an explanatory variable on level two. We're going to leave that aside. Two-level modeling is done, uh, and random is added because we want to have a random slope. And then this is sort of uh, standard for me now. B iterations, two processors are the two chains going forward in the trace plots, and that's what the PSR, convergence criterion, describes when they start moving in tandem. I always use B iterations at the minimum number of iterations that I want to use, and, uh, but sometimes then uh, M plus goes further because PSR did not go down to one in only 1,000 iterations, but it goes further and say it stops at 1,500. Well, then I want to go on to much higher, maybe require B iterations 5,000 to see the PSR close to one for a long stretch of iterations. So the model then is on within and on between. You have the random slope phi or phi, that is the auto regressive coefficient. Uh, with lag one. You have the random variance, in this case it's for the dependent variable, so it's the random residual variance. You have the random slope in the contemporary or concurrent regression of smoking urge or negative affect at the same time point. And then we add this negative affect uh, or negative affect time period previous for reasons uh, that uh, we want to uh, I, we, wa we want to be able to bring in negative affect into the model because it has missing data on it. Timur, uh, do we have to say neg f here to uh, bring it into the model? Is Timur here? While he thinks about that, I'll just describe the between level. So then you have the smoking urge, the uh, intercept, random intercept, the random uh, 
phi, the random residual variance, the random slope, regressed on the between level variable female and age, and you let the residual, uh, residuals be uh, covaried, uh, because there are probably many other uh, variables that influence them than female and age. And what's the answer to you, Mary? It's all, it's, it's negative, yeah, so it's already brought in as a dependent variable by that, by that statement. Right. Yeah, so, so you don't have to do anything further. So you can have missing data or negative affect here. Right. And no problem, yeah, okay. You can see this is all still very new for us. And then in the output, uh, we're going to ask for tech one because uh, Ellen loves tech one. And we are going to ask for tech one because Bengt loves tech one, tech eight rather, I should say. And we're going to do a factor score comparison. And when we say factor score, FS, we mean random effects. It's the same thing. Anything that's latent and continuous, it's a factor score in our words. If it's a factor, yes. If it's a random effect, yes. If it's a growth factor, yes. If it's a trait in the IRT, yes. It's a factor, factor score comparison. We're going to see what that looks like. As for standardized in the fashion that um, Ellen described, within person standardization, tech four, that is the mean variance covariances among the latent variables and the residual. And we're going to plot, and we're going to do plot, have available for the plot factors, all of the factors, and all of the random effects. This two level regression takes almost four minutes. If we drop this, uh, bringing in the factors into the plot, it goes down to three and point thirteen minutes. And this is a feature or, or part of the program that we might try to speed up so those two are less different. Here are the results. And here then you see the between level model plotted. And where the, we have these background variables, you know, that I described as W before. And we have the four random effects here. So it's an interesting regression. The dependent variables are all unobserved. How can you do that? Hmm? It's statistical magic again. So anyway, you have the uh, uh, effects then of female and age onto these four, and the only significant ones are the ones that have a negative and a plus sign here. <clears throat> so this says that females relative to males, conditional on age, have a lower autoregressive coefficient. Lower. So that's different from uh, negative affect, which where females tend to have a higher in research. But in smoking urge, it tends to have a lower one. And the residual variance, however, and therefore the whole variance of smoking urge, is higher for females. We're going to see what the consequences of that lower phi and higher log V are for females when we bring in distal outcomes over here. But for now, we're just saying uh, this, these are the results. And an interesting finding that I don't know how general it is, but phi on female uh, being significant here happens only because we allow log v and syx to be random. I'm saying this backwards to what the text is. Maybe that's confusing. So it's not significant unless both log v and syx are allowed to be random. So. Uh, that sort of speaks for including a lot of random, random effects, uh, which uh, may or may not be uh, causing problems in, because of other matters that we're going to discuss. All right. We are at 15 minutes to 3, which is the exact time we want to be for having 15 minutes of questions and answers. And uh, just know that you have to ask, ask me in, uh, simple questions, otherwise I'll just hand them over. Um, on the, I was keen in on the fact that we could look at a single subject using the, um, the time series n equals one. It just seems a simple extension to be able to do a multiple baseline um, kind of study that the behaviorists used to do where you would um, put in a phase of treatment so you create another variable that was a phase of treatment and be able to look at the um, intervention effects on individual subjects that are time embedded. So like an AB, AB this kind of design? Something like, well, except you, you, you observe one subject 
and then introduced an intervention. Then the second one is later introduced, and then the intervention oh, so timing a, is uh, that kind of wedge. Wedge, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right. I think there are nice unexplored possibilities in the n equals one or repeated n equals one type of analysis. Definitely, you should not overlook the uh, n equals one in favor of two-level analysis. Certainly, there's a lot there, and there's some interesting articles that I'm going to point to uh, in that n equals one area when we get to the afternoon. All right. Thank you. More questions? Yes. Um, we've been talking a lot about the latent centering, and in the most recent example, uh, I believe with the define command you were doing observed centering. Oh yeah, good question. Was there yeah, a reason I, I meant for to that? actually make that um, distinction. Here is the observed centering of negative affect, which is the uh, predictor down here. You know, the if you look at that picture, maybe that's easier. The latent variable centering refers to the, uh, the dependent variable up here. Uh, if we do a standard analysis here of uh, urge on negative affect, you can see that as just a standard random slope analysis where you do uh, a uh, group mean centering as recommended. So uh, that's for the observed variable. Is that, was that your question? I, I guess I'm just trying to understand the logic of how you made that decision there. Okay, yeah. Actually, uh, there are two things uh, conflated here. I started with a model that did not have this effect, did not have that effect. And in that case, it's clear that here you have a time series uh, model, and uh, you do the latent centering here, uh, uh, the implicit latent variable centering. Here, you have a standard uh, at the same time regression, and the regular rules for doing centering on the observed variables hold. Now, I complicated the model, and maybe I put myself in uh, jeopardy here by having a, a, a time series for negative affect as well, in which case, since we do that as uh, a latent variable centering as well for negative affect, right? Can you take a microphone from for? So, so basically, that is the same issue that uh, Ellen was talking about. So uh, when we have for the, repeated for the group, so we. Can so if you have y one on y two, um, so the the uh, the centering that's uh, available and it's resolved is when you have y one uh, y on y at one, right? In that case. Um, you don't have to do observed centering. When you say y and on y at one, you mean y on y m percent one, right? Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. So in that case, the centering is uh, you know automatic. Right. Uh, but if you have a path analysis like you do here, then that feature actually isn't available. So it's available if you have uh, non-random slopes, but in version eight, it's not available for random slopes. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. So this is where the, I think that's what Sadu. she was asking about. So here, so here, okay. Good, good reminder. So here, the latent variable decomposition of NEGAF is not done because it's done because NEGAF has a random slope pre-multiplying it. Is that correct? Uh, my, He's scratching I, his head. I, uh, you know, I think the question was about why negative effect is uh, observed centered. And the reason it's observed centered is because we don't have, if that, uh, the slow random slope SYX right. is random, then uh, we just don't have it right now. It's just one of the features right. that are left out. So we'll This was what I reminded host. Ellen about, right? Right, that's the and same issue. And then I put it yeah. aside and didn't see it in this context. Yes, OK. So give. Yes, yeah, exactly, and, and, and it may change and may become uh, uh, available in the next version. So the, to repeat, when you have a random slope like this, negative affect does not uh, do, is not, uh, a, a latent variable decomposition is not done for negative affect despite the fact that we do a uh, lagged regression. So the latent variable decomposition is only done for this variable, right? That's correct. But then somebody can argue, well, you have a random slope there, too. I'm just trying to make it. Uh, 
Well, that's, uh, you know, it's kind of, I think uh, you, you guys didn't, well, anyway, so it's available for that case, right? For that case, it's available, right? Right. Uh, it's when it's not available, it's when the, the relationship between the two variables is of lag zero. Ah, so it's not available when the relationship between two variables are, have lag zero, the contemporaneous or concurrent regression. Right. All right. I can see a whole set of pedagogical papers here. <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, we, you guys uh, didn't complain early enough about it, that's all. <laughs> that, that's exactly right, because we were learning as we go along here, and, and when you start teaching about it, you start thinking, oh, wait a minute, you know, that's when you really learn the, the depths of this. All right, so did you survive that? Yeah. All right. Good. Hi there. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so this is just to make sure that I understand, and hopefully others are in the same boat, or at least could benefit from this question. On slide 39. 39. Mm -hmm. Where you present your uh, time scores uh, across a 24-hour period. Sure, where you present your time scores across a 24-hour period. Right. Um, I guess it's two questions. So one. M plus can handle the first time score not being centered at zero. So for example, if this was real data, the first input for this individual could be 0.32. Is that correct? Right. Great. And like, it, like it is here, yeah. This is actually from the smoking data. OK. Terrific. And then the next question. Uh, if we go forward and go into the next day, so uh, new time 10, and we're going by two hours, it would be something in the ballpark of observed time 1.01. 1 .01. Exactly, one point something for the next day. Yeah. Okay, and, and so forth and so forth yeah, until the end. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. So back to the previous set of slides. So the, the presently, is Could it you hold your mic a little oh, closer sorry. so you get it well recorded? Is it, is it only, cap are you only capable of doing directional auto regressions? So in other words, would it be possible to say like, to combine that ampersand with a with statement so that if I don't have to posit a directional relationship on the X side, on the NA side. Or, or here you mean? Yeah, if you, f no, flip to the next slide please. Oh, okay. So right there, you drew a directional arrow there. Right, right here? Right, so what if I'm not willing to you know, make that assumption that there's a causal relationship then, there? Then you shouldn't say anything about this part because then it will be automatically done as with behind the scenes in a sense. But like regression, you don't estimate those parameters. So they are freely correlated. Say okay, nothing. Thank you. Hold, hold on a second. Hold on a second. We want your, we want your wisdom recorded, Tiamer. So, so the reason this is done, that relationship is there, is uh, because of um, there's missing data uh, on that variable. Uh, and uh, so having that arrow there would uh, imply that you get much better imputations for these missing values. Right. So I, I would, uh, you know, I mean, I, you know, ben, that's how Ben had it, and I, I uh, was pushing him to actually add that in there because it would should improve the estimation. I don't think it actually made any difference, but no, I did. In this but, example, but, but in principle, you know, you know uh, we have a lot of missing or some missing data on this variable, and to not uh, deplete our sample size throw away people, we, like we did yesterday, at the very end of the day, we bring this variable into the model by that regression, and then we can use everybody uh, if they have missing data on NA, but not missing data on urge, they get to participate in the estimation. Yeah. I have two related questions about the T intervals. Uh, one is if, if, if uh, there's more than one data point in a bin, how are those handled? And if there's more than one data point in the bin, we g do so-called flattening. <laughs> and Tiamer is going to explain exactly what that means tomorrow morning. Yeah. I'm glad you're interested. And then the second related question is um, if, uh, if, if it's not clear exactly you know, what intervals I should use for the bins, uh, is there a way to try you know, a couple of different kinds of binning? And are, are there, will M plus generate statistics to allow me to compare which one looks best? Yeah, so you, you uh, can change this. This setting can be changed 0 0.8, 0 0.04. You can vary that and see how sensitive the results are to that. And of course, it corresponds to two hour differences versus one hour differences, so substantively, it changes as well. 
And yeah, um, we have actually started conversations this week between TMR and TWI, our front end programmer, to provide a plot that compares the uh, real time with the time that we assess to show the, how closely related they are. So if they're too, uh, not closely enough related, you may um, want to adjust the T interval setting to something different. Okay. But yeah, the answer is there's no statistical tool that will actually determine that number. Right, no statistical, no statistical tool. Um, I'm interested in uh, the ability to predict the um, residual variance uh, mm -hmm. now. So I think that was in the last model where you were predicting. Here? Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, right. Like here. Yes. Um, so I'm thinking about how to interpret that. Is it that um, for females, the variance, the spread of the variance is actually larger than it is for males? Is that how should we, right. we should be thinking about it? Mm-hmm. Okay. And can you use, um, it's only possible to use between level variables to make that prediction? Uh, well, um, that's a good question. So you want to have um, a potential uh, predictor of uh, variance on within. That's uh, the chapter one in the book. You can actually let the uh, residual variance in the regression be a function of an observed variable uh, using model constraint. Timmer looks like, what is he talking about? But that is, you model heterogeneity uh, in the regression, that is, the residual variance varies as a function of the x value, for instance. That would be a within level matter. Do you want to add to that, Timmer? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the question completely, but you can, the, you know, the log variance of V, right, that's a latent variable on the between level, and it, you can put it anywhere you want, any structural equation. So, yeah, but, but he wants the uh, residual variance to be a function of a within level predictor here somewhere. Like a time varying covariate, like may maybe negative affect influencing that. Uh, I so uh, like in time, like in cross classified modeling, sort of. Yeah. So the uh, that's another one of these features that's not available. So the log right. variance is a random effect with res so it can vary across individuals, but not across time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a, that's one fact. Yeah. So uh, what can vary across time is intercepts uh, and uh, the order regressive coefficients, but not the uh, residual variance, not the log v. Uh, log v can vary across subjects, as can intercept and the slope as well, of course. Uh, again, this is not, you know, if we, you know, 8.1 8 might actually have that feature, so we'll... Uh, we're, yeah. we're, we're thinking 8 point, it's not version 8.1 here, there are lots of... Uh, little development or big development that we're excited about. But don't ask us when it will come out. 